Hello world, my name is Mitch Schultz and we are back for The Way of the Psychonaut live streams and I'm joined with director and producer Susan Hesler-Jay. Hi Susan. Hello Mitch and um, hello everybody. I, I'm a little nervous today because we are streaming my interview with Richard Tarnas who is also um, the founder of a program where I'm getting a master's, the <laughs> philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program at California Institute of Integral Science, um, Studies. But I, I am very, um, I really respect Richard Tarnas so much and appreciate his knowledge, especially when I heard him speak at a conference in Prague in 2017. And what he shared was so valuable and so profound and so I felt that, that if we could include that in the documentary, then we would really achieve our goal of presenting information that would help people transform. Because we're really at a, at a crossroads that, that speaks to the survival of not just the human species, but the biosphere. And so what Rick presents, I feel, um, gives us hope. And so anyway, I'm just thrilled that, that we're where he's going to be joining us afterwards to answer questions. So you should be on your best behavior today, Susan. We'll keep an yes. eye on that, okay? <laughs> um, well, yes, as Susan said, we're extremely excited to have Richard Tarnas join us today. We're gonna to play his interview now, and then we'll come back with Richard afterwards for a brief Q&A. And just to give you a sense of what uh, Richard's gonna talk about in the video, uh, Richard, explain, Richard Tarnas explains humanity's sense of separation from the natural world through a philosophical and historical perspective. This disconnect has resulted in the destruction of Earth's ecosystems, which Richard has refer, refers to as a crisis of consciousness for both individuals and the collective. He observes how Stan's work with psychedelics and exposure to Eastern philosophies allowed him to see the archetypal nature of non-ordinary experiences and note the similarities to ancient spiritual traditions. This rendered Stan's approach psych <coughs> psychiatrically grounded and spiritually informed. Seeing how the traumas underlying Stan's four basic pre, excuse me, perinatal matrices are reflected in humanity's fear of mortality, the fear of the feminine, and the need to control nature. Richard believes humanity is poised for a collective death and rebirth experience. And with that, here's Richard Charnas' interview. Thank you. Well, I'm Richard Tarnas, Rick to all my friends and family, and I've been, uh, I'm a professor of cultural history and philosophy, depth psychology, kind of a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, scholar in that way. I come from um, a, a kind of interesting sequence of um, powerful influences in my life that are very different from each other because on the one hand, um, I was educated by the Jesuits uh, uh, up through high school. Then I went to Harvard uh, in the late 60s and got really at the height of the counterculture and the psychedelic revolution, um, but also very much taking in, continuing to take in the Western intellectual cultural tradition. And then went to Esalen uh, for uh, 10 years uh, where I became uh, director of programs and, and education there. And then I've been a, a, a writer and a professor in all the years since then, which is now, you know, some 30 years. And uh, each of those places and, and kind of learning communities had a, had a huge uh, influence on me. And in some ways I can see my life work is kind of synthesizing and, and bridging uh, between counterculture and culture, uh, between, uh, between East and West, North and South, uh, modern and postmodern in one direction, and ancient and uh, kind of primal indigenous uh, cultural wisdom traditions in the other direction. And, uh, so esoteric and exoteric, all those are very, that, those polarities are very powerful in me. I suppose also a, 
a masculine feminine um, polarity is very uh, important and I think it it's certainly been uh, psychologically and intellectually uh, powerful and enriching for me, but I believe it's a, that all these polarities help us see more deeply into the evolution of human consciousness and worldviews that have led to our, our current moment. And I suppose if I were describing my most uh, mm, urgent uh, focus in my current uh time of life it's to it's to understand our our moment in history and to see what has what has gone into shaping it um on the one hand the kind of the the, the dy dynamism and nobility of our of our uh and the brilliance of of, of the human experiment and uh even of the modern um uh, civilization, which is not, I mean, it's just such a combination of sort of light and shadow, to, to recognize, I guess, really that light and shadow dimension and how, in certain ways, many of the qualities that have shaped what we are most, uh, what we find most precious about who we are and uh, our, our moral and spiritual aspirations <clears throat> is also intertwined with uh, the crisis we are in and how uh, humanity and particularly modern civilization has precipitated a, a, an, an ecological crisis, also a spiritual crisis and a cultural uh, and multicultural crisis that um, I believe the more uh, reflection and understanding we can bring to, to, to this powerful time in history that we're both um, uh, sentenced to be living in and also privileged to be living in, the, the better. I think what defines the modern identity, the modern mind and, and self, uh, is very much connected to a sense of a separation between the human subject and the rest of the world. The, the, including one's own body uh, and deep psyche, but also um, other, uh, other people, other species, the rest of the, 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 the world as object, distinct from, different from the, uh, the self as the subject. And that sense of a, of a deep split between subject and object is partly what gives us our, our sense of autonomy, our sense of freedom, of, of agency, of being able to, um, uh, let's say, control our emotions or direct our, our thinking or to question uh, beliefs and so forth, uh, <clears throat> to go our own way and not necessarily be doing exactly what our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents and tribe have been teaching us to be since we were born. All those um, aspects of our of our of our freedom, um, which are which includes even spiritual and moral freedom, those are precious to us. But <clears throat> that same split, uh, that forging of the autonomous self, that has been so much part of the modern project, has also uh, involved a, a separation from the whole, which ca has resulted in a deep, um, a, a deep uh, possible alienation, uh, a sense of being a stranger in a strange land, of living in a world that um, is <clears throat> purposeless, meaningless, uh, that only human beings have purpose and meaning and conscious intelligence, uh, values, and uh, while the, the rest of the world is seen as being um, this kind of meaningless void that human beings have to uh, find their way in and um, s flourish in, even survive, but often through feeling that it needs to ex control, understand in order to predict and control and exploit resources. And uh, in a sense, we've moved from uh, an earlier condition that was characteristic of humanity before the modern era uh, of, of a, a less 
uh, differentiated uh, self world, uh, there was more of a sense of being embedded in the natural world, which was seen as being uh, capable of meaning and purpose and communicating that through uh, whether it's the um, movements of the of, of nature, the wind, the 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 ocean, the um, the planetary alignments, the, the cycles of the sun and moon. All of these were seen as, in a sense, being pregnant with uh, m uh, meaning and purpose that were coherent with human meanings and purposes. And indigenous uh, cultural traditions tended to have a highly developed capacity to, to read the world in that way. Uh, there was a sense that the interior of the human being was continuous with the interior of um, the rest of the uh, earth community, of, of, of the animals, the plants, the, the land, the mountain, the water, the, the heavens. And so uh, I, I think what has gone on is that this highly developed and, and, and eventually technologically empowered um, modern self increasingly f f spiritually isolated within its own uh, bubble has experienced a kind of uh, uh, hunger, a spiritual hunger and a desire to <clears throat> fill that void uh, any way it can and if one is living in basically a mechanistic universe that is kind of understood in a materialistic way, then consumerism becomes kind of the obvious way in which one would uh, satisfy the, um, the hunger. And so that combination of a kind of misdirected spiritual hunger that goes into consumerism combined with a kind of, with the uh, technologically empowered, uh, brilliant, <clears throat> modern rational mind. Uh, and then you combine that with a sort of um, greed uh, that particularly can take place at the, like, you know, in, in corporate financial decisions and so forth. You, we've created a, a kind of techno-consumerist <clears throat> frenzy uh, that is uh, cannibalizing the, the earth and uh, also producing you know, tremendous cli climatic and uh, biological and geological changes that are catastrophic for most of the earth community and increasingly for humanity itself. So where I believe uh, we could, on one level, describe everything that's happening in terms of ecological, economic, uh, industrial civilization, etc. Uh, I think we can also recognize that there are deep, that it's a crisis of consciousness, it's a crisis of, of vision, of, of, of psychological lucidity, of self-understanding, of, of philosophical um, insight. Uh, even and it's and it's a it's a it's a religious spiritual crisis as well, so <clears throat> the whole thing comes as a package. And I think the more we can um, come to an understanding of the of the the role in which our consciousness as individuals and also uh, as a collective psyche uh, of of all of humanity, the more we can. Uh, understand that and also play a role in uh, transforming our consciousness, then the more likely we will be able to build a, uh, a life-enhancing civilization instead of a, a one that is not only destructive but uh, suicidal. So uh, that's why I think the kind of work that um, um, the consciousness movement that uh, that <clears throat> the great depth psychology tradition that comes uh, out of uh, Freud and Jung and um, Marie Louise von Franz and uh, and that uh, 
someone like Stan Groff has taken to such a highly developed uh, level of, of theory and practice, the more I, we can incorporate the really what has been, I would call it the depth psychology revolution of this past century, the more we can incorporate that, the more we are going to be uh, able to navigate our way into the future uh, in, a, in a truly life-enhancing way. Well, what I think makes Stan's um, contribution so uh, significant and uh, in a way unique is that on the one hand, he's coming from uh, the psychoanalytic tradition in a kind of um, pure way that came in through Prague uh, in his uh, psychoanalytic education in the 1950s. At the same time, he was re receiving the recipient from Sandoz Laboratories of the LSD um, ampules with the recommendation that uh, they experiment with it to see it, that it could, it could be uh, of value in, at that point they were thinking more teaching um, psychiatrists and, and students, medical uh, school psychiatric students about um, what psychosis might be to better understand schizophrenia, et cetera. And uh, in fact, as Stan you know, started doing the work, it turned out to have just tremendous uh, power in transforming people's, uh, and actually catalyzing, not only transforming their consciousness, but catalyzing the therapeutic process, and also opening up um, insights into the nature of reality and a kind of expansion of consciousness that no one was expecting uh, before they had taken the, taken the substance. And so <clears throat> Stan was in this situation where he's, he's working with patients week after week, day after day, but he's giving these, um, these patients uh, first kind of moderate doses of, of LSD for, for some time. And what it did was by this being uh, what Stan would call a nonspecific catalyst, it, it, it didn't produce a definite uh, vector of response for uh, everybody. Each person, depending on the state of their psyche as well as the setting and, and preparation, et cetera, but above all on um, really the <clears throat> the place where that person was at deep inside and what their, the, the state of their unconscious, um, that the, the psychedelic effect was to, to raise that into consciousness and kind of flood the consciousness with what was, is normally suppressed. And uh, as a result, um, Stan developed a, two things. One was a, a he, he brought an openness to whatever was coming up, instead of kind of imposing a, a particular interpretive um, framework or paradigm on each person's um, journey or uh, LSD session, uh, he realized that he needed to be more like a midwife who is facilitating what's happening and not controlling it, not directing it, not uh, not over-interpreting it, in fact, <clears throat> bringing in too many uh, words and, and uh, in, verbal interaction could really get in the way of what was often the most um, significant healing uh, experience uh, that they might, uh, that that person might be going through. And so, on the one hand, he had this, this kind of radical openness to the psyche without imposing theory, a particular theory. On the other hand, he had this uh, e extremely potent um, catalyst. And so what opened up week after week, year after year, was a kind of vision of the depth and expanse and richness of the human psyche and also in a remarkable way, he, he was able to um, recognize through their experiences and his own experiences, he was able to recognize, uh, he got a, 
he got a, a cartography of the of the psyche and human psyche started to emerge that allowed him to recognize the the precise connections between what would normally be seen as being kind of like everyday psychiatric syndromes. Uh, it could be a, a particular phobia, or it could be, uh, you know, like um, this is like fear of heights, or or it could be a claustrophobia, or but it also could be like obsessive compulsive neurosis, or it could be mania, uh, <clears throat> or uh, profound depression, or the different types of depression, and he was able to see how underneath those symptoms were first of all. Um, very uh, potent experiences that could have come in and were uh, in childhood uh, that could have been very traumatic, um, but also people were able to tune into very positive experiences as well, and 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 even retrieve very emotionally nourishing experiences that they'd forgotten, like how much their parents really did love them, you know, for example, uh, and and be very healed by that. But either through the, um, the integration of traumatic experiences, reliving them and releasing them from the, from the uh, psyche and the body, uh, but also getting in touch with very uh, healing experiences as well, there, he was having just uh, extraordinary um, results with, it, with his patients. And what he found was that below the, um, what we might call the, the conventional psychoanalytic understanding of the psyche, which basically starts at birth and goes up to the present, uh, and that our early childhood experiences and uh, even infancy and onward tend to be um, the most influential in shaping who we are today. What uh, the evidence um, suggested that these many individuals who were doing this deep inner work uh, was bringing forth, um, what, it, what those sessions suggested was that underneath that was the very powerful experience of, of birth itself and an encounter with death, uh, with our own mortality, um, intertwined in a quite a, a richly complex way, and that uh, in turn, even um, informing even those, uh, the, the death rebirth and kind of perinatal, as he calls them, experiences, are even deeper dimensions in the psyche um, that are like ancestral experiences, phylogenetic, historical experiences that, sh that shape the lives of many individuals. Um, uh, and uh, karmic experiences where people would have the quite um, realistic sense that they had lived in a previous life, the events of which had played a role in the shaping of their own life and of their own birth, etc., cetera, and, and their unfolding of their life. So this kind of transpersonal unconscious uh, opened up beyond just the personal unconscious, and then informing the whole uh, vastly expanded uh, psyche was a sense of uh, that there were uh, powerful archetypal principles or forces or powers that, that um, were at the core of, on the one hand, these different you know, ancestral or karmic or perinatal experiences, but also were at the, uh, right at the, core of our everyday neurotic symptoms, for example. And so it just allowed uh, Stan to start making links between psychiatry, psychoanalysis, depth psychology on the one hand, with um, shamanic traditions, with the, with, uh, the mystical and spiritual insights of, of the great uh, <clears throat> um, Asian, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, Taoist, but also you know, Christian mysticism, uh, uh, Jewish mysticism, um, Sufism, and so forth. He was able to see the, 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 the connections uh, in a way that 
permitted the, a, a kind of integration of religion and psychology or spirituality and, and uh, psychotherapy in a way that was not just a kind of general feel-good um, orientation. It was a, a highly detailed, intellectually sophisticated, and therapeutically um, highly effective practice uh, and, and theory. So I think um, Stan, I probably should add one other thing about Stan's um, approach, and that is it took a lot of courage. Um, he, uh, is, which is not anything that he would ever talk about, but it was anybody who's done this kind of um, work, either uh, working with others or f in one's own experiences, is quite aware that, I mean, this is a, one, one, one is living, uh, one is going through experiences that would be not unlike what I imagine explorers who were going to lands that had never been visited before uh, by their by their people um, and or space uh, you know astronauts who were going into space and nobody had ever been there before and just that sense of uh, what Stan calls it, a kind of adventure in consciousness. But it's not an adventure where it's always just like a happy um, uh, roller coaster ride in which you know that you're going to be safe, uh, even though it's a pretty uh, exciting. There, there are real dangers in the path, and uh, it takes a very uh, courageous person to be able to hold a... Um, a, a, a vessel or a, a container for a person to go through these experiences and um, convey to them a sense of trust in the psyche, uh, of trust in, their, in, the, in, the, in the process uh, of what they're going through, even when it is a dark night of the soul, even when they think they're, they may be dying. The, the thing that they're most afraid of is it tends to be exactly what holds the uh, potential for the greatest healing. And he was able to convey that sense of, of uh, trust in the psyche, and in a, which is partly a result of his own um, courage in exploring that and coming back uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a kind of empowered, elevated, and, and, uh, and at the same time very kind of humble person. Uh, and, he, and he was able to convey that to so many people who in turn have gone on to become uh, healers, therapists, facilitators with many other people. And so he's really had quite a, uh, an influence in you know, that kind of serene equilibrium that he holds as a person is something that I think has, even when he's not the therapist in the room uh, with a, uh, someone else, he has essentially imparted the spirit of his, um, let's call it you know, trust and spiritual equilibrium in a way. He's been able to convey that to, uh, to so many others that it's carried now, uh, even when he's not there, out in other, all the different parts of the world that people are, are, are doing this kind of, of work. And I think that, um, you know, we had, uh, when, when we were at Esalen uh, many years ago, we had a conference, uh, a, psych a conference on psychedelics in which we brought many of the great um, figures in the early years of LSD psychotherapy and so forth, including Albert Hoffman, who came from Switzerland. Uh, Sasha Shulgin was there. Um, you know, just many of the key people from the early years, uh, Leo Zeff. And uh, Albert Hoffman said something quite uh, important. He said, you know, here's the person who first discovered LSD, synthesized it, had the first LSD session. And here's a chemist who basically also was something of a mystic. 
uh, and he said, "My, I believe that LSD had such a kind of um, caused such a, a problematic uh, impact on the culture when it came when it was being disseminated in the 1960s, uh, because." Modern civilization did not have adequate, an adequate uh, ritual container for such a powerful medicine to be uh, used in an appropriate way. And so people were just you know, taking it in every which way uh, and with plenty of uh, wonderful experiences, but plenty of uh, quite... Um, at times catastrophic or you know traumatic or you know, very problematic experiences. So uh, I think um, one of the things that Stan has helped initiate is a, the bringing of a kind of wisdom into the use of these powerful medicines, uh, a wisdom that is both spiritual and uh, psychotherapeutic and uh, is kind of psychiatrically grounded, but is also spiritually informed. And that's a great gift. When Stan uh, was finding people, uh, when they had moved very deep into their uh, psychological process, they typically started having basically feelings of a kind of existential crisis and facing, facing uh, their death uh, and at the same time feeling like they were reliving the trauma of their birth and losing the womb and, uh, and, and being in a state of, of kind of great struggle with the, um, with the birth canal and, and not being able to breathe and, and and at the same time feeling like they're being expelled from this, this whole universe that had been their, their nourishing womb and now suddenly is turned on them, it seems. And uh, the, the intensity and global nature of this experience was so uh, overwhelming and it, it wasn't just physical, though the, the physical or somatic part of it was, was titanically intense, uh, but it, it, as you can imagine, if, when, if you've ever seen birth or given birth as a, as a, as a mother, uh, you, you can get some sense of the, the physical intensity of what it must be for the, for the baby being born. And uh, at the same time, um, it, it not only has these physical dimensions, but it's got uh, emotional and even spiritual, religious, philosophical dimensions like a sense of existential crisis that, uh, and the sense that does life have any meaning and uh, that everything, uh, s s human suffering seems to be um, uh, purposeless and, uh, and so forth. And that as people really went through this experience, they <clears throat> would reach a kind of climactic a uh, place of uh, total annihilation, and then uh, suddenly the, it would open up to uh, the sense that they've moved into a new universe and a new being. Uh, 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 they've come. They've come into a new dimension of of life, and everything that seemed to be meaningless suddenly has meaning. And what seemed to be a purposeless um, agony now turns out to have been serving uh, a larger purpose of creating an, a new life. Uh, and um, in addition, there was a whole masculine-feminine uh, dynamic here because the encounter with birth was also an encounter, an encounter with the power of the female body and uh, the the... Um, and the tremendous ambivalence between the sense of the feminine as being this nourishing womb and then suddenly uh, something that was life-threatening and uh, uh, defeating, constraining, uh, annihilating. And uh, when, 
what Stan found was that people who hadn't, uh, where, where that level of the psyche was kind of close to the surface and it hadn't been integrated, there was a tendency to uh, be in a very reactive formation against uh, the feminine in many different forms. Uh, <clears throat> and that one could even see that this was not just an individual uh, phenomenon, it was a collective uh, phenomenon that, in a sense, humanity is born out of nature or is, emerges from the, the womb of uh, a, a more undifferentiated embeddedness in the natural world. And as human beings become more and more kind of distinctively, uh, their distinct consciousness and separated uh, and more in a condition of through their wit and will, they're making their way through the world uh, rather than feeling at one with the instinctual energies that teach them how to live. Uh, and now they're having to face their, their separation and their mortality in a profound way. And that this can uh, result in a, a, a deeply ambivalent attitude towards nature sometimes looking to it for nourishment, for, uh, uh, you know, emotionally, spiritually, etc., but also uh, fear of nature uh, and the desire to control nature, which can be quite rational when you look at, you know, uh, wanting to um, control the impact of storms and um, diseases and so forth, but also can take a form of wanting to, of no, of, wanting to control nature and exploit it and even uh, avenge oneself uh, against uh, nature. And this all seems to uh, be connected to this perinatal level of the unconscious. And as I uh, was um, in, in the years that I was kind of, I'd already kind of integrated Stan's work, but I was also looking, you know, writing The Passion of the Western Mind, this book that narrates the, um, the development of Western thought and culture from the ancient Greeks and Hebrews right up to the present postmodern. And uh, I became more and more aware of how much our current um, crisis, the encounter with mortality, the sense of uh, a crisis of meaning, uh, the, the defeat of our old uh, traditional identity, uh, tremendous sense of conflict be uh, about the, you know, the role of, of the feminine, of, of women's power, uh, of um, um, the feminine dimension of, of the divine. All these are uh, very topical right now, but also the, 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 the sense of facing mortality, not only on the individual level, but now on the planetary level. In all these different ways, uh, it seemed that we had recreated, or maybe life has, re has created, uh, a, a, a situation that is extremely like our birth. And, uh, and it is as if in the same way that going through the perinatal dimension of the psyche and integrating the death rebirth um, experience resembles the great death rebirth uh, initiation rituals and rites of passage of indigenous uh, peoples, uh, of the ancient um, uh, mystery religions and so forth. In, I believe that humanity itself today may be going through a kind of initiatory experience. And, uh, but instead of being separated from the rest of the tribe as one, as one is in an initiatory rite, rite of passage, or instead of being separated from the individual you know, mother as the uh, baby is as in, the, in, the, in the birth process, 
humanity has essentially undergone a separation from the rest of the entire community of being. You know, Mother Nature, uh, uh, the, 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 the cosmic uh, womb of life, as it were. And that we seem to be going through a kind of perinatal, uh, initiatory rite of passage. And the more, uh, so that Stan's whole um, understanding of the human psyche and of the healing process and the, and the role of facing death and integrating these deep uh, kind of perinatal levels of, of uh, experience in us could play a very, uh, it, first of all, it becomes very relevant to understanding our more global situation uh, and all sorts of um, riddles about our time. Like why all, all that particular combination of you know, ecological crisis, of uh, uh, women's rights, uh, and um, how the spontaneous emergence of uh, archetypal images of the, of the divine feminine, which have come so much into uh, uh, many people's ex life, ex into their psyches, into their visions, into their dreams and experiences over these last uh, recent decades. <clears throat> Um, the, the, the existentialist uh, alienation of 20th, much of 20th century philosophy, for example, um, all these start to make sense in a more coherent way by bringing uh, uh, Stan Gross' understanding of the psyche and of the, the perinatal dimension and the archetypal dimension into, uh, a, 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 into an understanding of our... Um, of our, our global, spiritual, ecological, uh, cultural uh, crisis. So um, I think we are in many ways today at a, uh, in, a, in a pivotal place where the more people who both do the inner work uh, on themselves so that they don't just project and act out that, this drama, um, which is in fact what too many people are doing at a very high level of power today in our country and in many countries around the world uh, with catastrophic effects. Uh, but if there could be more and more of this, uh, basically the, the courage to do the inner work and also to support each other in going through the, 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 the powerful emotional and, and uh, um, psychological challenges uh, of, of this kind of initiatory process, because it's not easy, but we're all in it. Uh, we're in it collectively, uh, even if we may suppress it from our consciousness, it's, it's, it's shaping all of our life experience day, day by day. And uh, I think um, the work of, uh, of Stan and um, m many other people who are uh, uh, part of this kind of consciousness transformation um, movement in its, in its many uh, forms uh, are, are playing a crucial role in the possibility of basically cre um, helping us through as a species through this uh, crucible of transformation. So, uh, I think uh, Stan's work is, is uh, absolutely um, relevant for uh, understanding it, but also even provides highly uh, uh, potent tools, um, technologies of transformation of, of the sacred, uh, as it were. Uh, and uh, for that, we can be very grateful. You know, in the course of, of human evolution, there this impulse towards you know, freedom, towards autonomy, uh, that um, helped helped bring about a sense of distinction or separation between the organism and the environment, between self and world, and all the ways that we we're talking about subject and object. Uh, 
humanity and nature, or man and nature, as it, as it has often been discussed, and I think with archetypal reason, because there's a kind of masculine uh, drive to that at, in some respects. So uh, that created this kind of dualist state of dualistic exploitation, alienation, empowerment, but also ultimately a kind of fall. And, and that's, that's the crisis we're in. And uh, the, it's interesting that part of the package of achieving a sense of, of autonomy, of, of our own personal and kind of human freedom as a, as a species, is a sense of being very special. Like, man is the crown of creation. Uh, how like an, how uh, the the ascent of man, you know, or or even just even if we take it out of the that kind of masculinist uh, framing, but just the sense of the human species just being uh, absolutely the on separately superior to the rest of the world uh, because of our tremendously uh, brilliant, complex intelligence and uh, consciousness and so forth. And one of the things about uh, the death-rebirth experience at the individual level is that that sense of specialness gets obliterated. One realizes one is like everybody else, just amongst the rest of humanity. Like um, suddenly that sense of wanting to be a very special person and the, the inflation that one uh, may be unconsciously living out all the time gets kind of uh, systematically worn down by these experiences until you realize, oh, I too have to die like everyone else. And this suffering that I'm going through or this, this, this illness now that I'm subject to or this um, psychopatho you know, psychopathological condition that I'm prey to uh, means I'm, I'm just like everyone else. And I'm, uh, it's, it's at first is a, is a great fall. It's a, it's a, it's humiliating. It's like suddenly being ground down, but then there's the great liberation of being just like everyone else and feeling that you're part of a larger community of, of life that um, rather than that inflated, special, unique, isolated in its own bubble consciousness that we you know, tend, tend to uh, grow into as we um, moderns have grown up. So uh, everything that I just described there, that kind of movement from um, the sense of special uniqueness, super superiority, and separateness, uh, also seems to be true, I believe, of what we are as a species going through. And just as there's so much research now showing how, how similar in many ways we are to the rest of uh, the animal kingdom, for example, that many of the qualities that we pride ourselves on, like our capacity to, uh, like the certain uh, m m impulses towards uh, ethical relationship to others. That's been developed uh, by the, the, the mammalian um, uh, lineage for, for and, and very, you can see it in primates, you can see it in many other f forms of, uh, of, of animal life, you know, and start, starting to recognize how much plants have intelligence and capacity to uh, um, even act purposefully in certain ways, and uh, the, the recognition that our intelligence, our sentience is, first of all, something that is, has a family resemblance to the rest of the um, beings in the Earth community, and also ultimately to recognize that we are part of the cosmos, and in fact we are the cosmos except in human form. And so at the, in the very act of losing, going through the kind of e ego death of our self-exalting uh, human superiority, we 
have the opportunity to um, connect to the, the, the cosmos itself, which we recognize as living in us and uh, in which we are suddenly again special and even unique, each of us individuals and our, as a species we're unique, but not because um, we are just superior to everything else or any, everybody else, but rather uh, that the cosmos has flowered in this way in that person and this way in myself and this way in that, um, in that lion and this way in that uh, redwood tree and in this way um, in, in the uh, ocean wave. And uh, so suddenly one has a, you kind of recover all the sense of one's um, uniqueness and uh, perhaps even like sense of meaning and, and calling, but it's now a calling that is working through you because instead of being like, in a potted plant, you're now planted in the earth and you, you're, you're drawing on the nutrients of the whole soil of the whole earth and, and the, the sun and the, and the water. And uh, it's, it's a whole different, um, I mean, I think that's basically uh, an essential aspect of the death rebirth experience. And I think uh, this is, this for both individuals and humanity as a whole, uh, is connected to that movement from being in a state of dualistic uh, separation, um, impulse to control and exploit from above, uh, and then also alienation, to move from that to a participatory relationship to the cosmos where I, as a part of the cosmos, am also, uh, I, I am now re-embedded in the whole, and in some sense the whole is in me, is speaking in me, and actually as I do go deep into my, 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 my soul's depths, I actually can connect with the whole and have experiences of, of um, potentially any other part of, of, the, uh, of the cosmic splendor. Uh, so. Uh, again, this is uh, a, an example of how the kinds of therapeutic practices and uh, paths, disciplines uh, that uh, Stan and others have been um, developing and, and cultivating over these decades has relevance, I think, for the whole um, civilization and for the whole species in our relationship to the whole. Uh, cosmos to the um, and to the Earth community, which we have been destructively <clears throat> um, uh, separated from and uh, interacting with in in a kind of autistic way, where we couldn't hear the couldn't hear the, the, their voices, we couldn't we couldn't communicate with their with their uh, with the soul, uh, the anima mundi, the soul of the world. I think people who uh, are in touch with the state of the world right now, uh, in uh, they're bringing all their awareness and their their scientific understanding, but also just the the, the full vision as much as possible of where we are uh, in our evolution on the planet today. Uh, recognize that we're we're basically all skating on thin ice. There is a profound sense of of uncertainty uh, and potentially uh, you know, looming uh, danger of, a, of, of, a, of catastrophic proportions. And it takes a lot of courage to face that uh, and to face it without, um, you know, we can't, we can't simply be sure we can be bringing in some technological fix or rational solution to the situation. We're, we're in territory that humanity has never uh, faced before. Um, in fact, the Earth community has never faced something at this level of uh, the speed of the mass extinction, for example. And uh, 
One of the things that's been helpful for me to remember is how much uncertainty itself is a key part of any uh, initiatory transformation. Uh, we all know, for example, how much uh, when people have near-death experiences, uh, an encounter with mortality in one form or another, it's the most m transformational experience that they can go through. They, it reconfigures their moral value system. And uh, I think <clears throat> we are today having to face such a threshold uh, of, of mortality as a species, as a civilization. And uh, if we can keep in mind that that uncertainty uh, is crucial for the transformation. You can't have a pretend near-death experience in order to have a, uh, an effective transfiguration of, your, of, your, of how you live. You need to really feel everything is at stake and you don't know the outcome. And if we can have the courage to face that and, uh, and to take, go through this, this dark night of the soul in some sense uh, as a, a, together, and to bring all our wits and heart and imagination and um, bravery uh, together to engage this, this great threshold, I think that's the key to, to our, our, our future. The way of the Psychonaut screens and Q&A with uh, Richard Tarnas. We hope that you all enjoyed the conversation um, and the interview from the documentary and hopefully it give you some ideas for some questions you might want to ask Rick later in the uh, interview. But before we jump into that, Susan, if you could do the proper introduction, please. Okay. Richard Tarnas is the founding director, director of the Graduate Program in Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness at the California Institute of Integral Studies, where he currently teaches. Born in 1950 in Geneva, Switzerland of American parents, he grew up in Michigan where he received a classical Jesuit education. In 1968, he entered Harvard where he studied Western intellectual and cultural history and depth psychology. Graduating, graduating with an AB cum laude in 1972. For 10 years, he lived and worked at Esalen Institute studying with Stanislav Grof, Joseph Campbell, Gregory Bateson, Houston Smith, and James Hillman later serving as Esalen's Director of Programs and Education. He received his PhD from Saybrook Institute in 1976 with a dissertation on LSD psychotherapy and psychoanalysis and spiritual transformation. From 1980 to 1990, he wrote The Passion of the Western Mind, a narrative history of Western thought from the ancient Greek to the postmodern, which became a bestseller. In 2006, he published Cosmos and Psyche, Intimations of a New World View, which received the Book of the Year Prize from the Scientific and Medical Network in the UK. Formerly president of the International Transpersonal Association, he is on the board of governors of the C.G. Jung Institute of San Francisco. In addition to his teaching at CIIS, um, he gives many public lectures and seminars in the U.S. and abroad. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, Susan. Thank All right, thanks for well. joining us. Yeah. Well, if it's okay, I will go ahead and start off with the questions to uh, kick off the Q&A here. And um, again, we just want to thank you for being part of this, being part of the documentary, and then joining us for this Q&A and, and sharing your thoughts with, uh, with the community. So, My pleasure. So in your description of your life experience, um, there's such a variety there from your Jesu Jesuit education, going to Harvard, um, kind of a slew of different intellectual thought and culture that come into Esalen. And then also being this bridge uh, between culture and counterculture or playing with the masculine and the feminine. And these polarities, as you described, um, really talk about the evolution of human consciousness. And you know, considering our current kind of moment in history right now with everything that is going on, um, and then this idea of the constantly changing uh, moral and spiritual aspirations, as you mentioned, or the changing uh, consciousness, what would you recommend kind of people dive into to kind of better understand the kind of this holistic or integrated universe that, we, that we're embedded in? It's not that we're separate from this, but we are particip participating in this.
excellent uh, videos, uh, uh, lectures, interviews, and so forth. Um, and those are important. Where did we lose it? It was pretty Oh. Okay. After so, the intro. After the So we didn't hear my question or we heard it? I'll bring us back in, Richard. Oh, okay. I think I was just about to go into uh, the practice like how to bring it into practice. This theory and put it into practice. So Rick, if you could please continue there, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, so, uh, I was just talking about the idea that uh, we we clearly need theory and practice. The the one informs the other. I think what was Stan uh, Groff himself is somebody who, I mean, so much of his even though he's well prepared through you know psychoanalytic education and uh, classical education and uh, multilingual uh, background. He had a lot of intellectual and cultural resources to draw on, but there was something uh, about his path in life that that brought him into uh, contact with an extremely powerful um, uh, method of of deep self exploration and transformation, um, psychological, somatic, spiritual, and so uh, I think most people listening uh, on this uh, call or watching are going to uh, be already engaged in practices. And I can just encourage uh, more and more that I, the idea of um, we can't really tune into a larger, deeper, more holistic worldview without a shift of the heart. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, not just, it's not just an intellectual thing. Intellect is totally important. Uh, it it can help elucidate things. It can help us uh, get a, um, uh, a a more uh, kind of objective handle on our subjectivity. We can we can rise above it when we're in a kind of uh, possession state by a particular emotion or something like that. There's a definitely room for reason, uh, rationality, and for uh, for uh, ideas that will illuminate us. But unless we go through some kind of deep um, inner transformation, uh, we will have certain things, uh, we'll be blind to certain things. It's, it's kind of like there's an armoring or a filter that uh, blocks out our access to, to the deeper uh, dimensions of, of life. And so um, it, it doesn't have to be LSD psychotherapy or holotropic breath work. Uh, uh, I mean, I think those happen to be along with uh, sacred medicine work and you know indigenous uh, ritual practices over the millennia ha have tremendous uh, power and efficacy. So I hold those and re uh, with reverence. <clears throat> you do need to have very good. Um, uh, context for that you need you need a guide you need a you need people who uh, to hold the experience uh, for you but uh, there's no there's no replacing that uh, importance of inner transformational work I might just add one other thing and that is we're talking about these special kind of non ordinary states of consciousness that we access in these in these uh, through these practices and those are crucial but so much of the practice that brings us into a more deeply holistic or relational um, uh, connection to, to the rest of the world has to do with our relationships. We have to, it, 
I mean, every single interaction we have with our, our, our uh, partner or spouse or our children or our friends or our neighbors or our students or teachers, uh, whoever it is, each relationship is a kind of opportunity for um, spiritual practice and probably, and the more intimate the relationship, the more um, demanding the spiritual practice and the more transformational it can be. So I think uh, in, in uh, both of those um, ways, relational, uh, deep uh, states uh, of uh, transformational practices, both of those play a crucial role in kind of allowing us to both open our minds and our hearts and in some sense even our our, our bodies to to the um, to the sacred whole that is, uh, holds us and surrounds us that's right yeah and I think a lot of times um, those close personal relationships we tend to take for granted and we forget of that forget how much is going on in that space and I think it's a very very good point so especially in this moment right now where those relationships have um, are in all sorts of particular constellations, configurations, depending on who happens to be living in, in the home that you might be um, uh, sequestered in. Absolutely. Susan? Yeah, and Rick, you know, that I was going to, I think that sort of brings me to a question I wanted to ask about the importance of, of places like Esalen or Hollyhock and the idea of, of where people can come together and in a, in a shared collective um, approach to these kinds of transformative experiences and building community that there's a, a safety and a greater possibility that occurs because of that community. Yeah, um, you, you mentioned Esalen, and of course that's where uh, both Stan Groff and, and I, that's where we met and um, where our work unfolded for most of the 1970s and, and 80s. And uh, I think of Esalen as being one of many uh, uh, places and in a sense like communities, uh, learning communities, transformational communities around the world. I think of them as, as heroic communities in a certain way. Uh, heroic in the sense that they are holding a vision of, uh, of the good uh, they're holding a vision and values that are in some ways in sharp contrast to that that's those that are carried by the mainstream society. And uh, the thing about the great work that we're all uh, involved in right now and the, the, the great crisis that is upon us, um, and we can address that more uh, because it's not only, it's, there's there's different levels of the crisis right now that are uh, up front for us, but we can't bring about these transformations either in our own lives or for the world as a whole on our own. Uh, we have we have to uh, do this with others. We need others. We need communities to uh, in which for for two big reasons. A community both holds space for the individuals within it to, to, to flower. To, and flowering means to go through uh, a, a deep metamorphosis and one has to, and that requires a kind of dying to an old identity and it requires a lot of hard work and, and often pain and uh, at times disorientation and not knowing, not having hope at times and so forth. And one, one needs to be in uh, dialogue with and, and em emotionally cared for by, by the people, the, a, a community that both cares for you and cares for a vision, uh, a transformational vision that could bring us to a more life enhancing um, form of our civilization. So uh, I think of these communities are, they're very important uh, both for holding space for each other to go through the deep hard work that we have to. And they're important because uh, we need to be able to hold a vision and articulate it uh, and think it through 
and communicate uh, with others. We, you, a person who's just completely isolated, they can hold a vision, you know, to some extent, but until it starts bouncing off of other people and being enriched by the by the dialogue and also um, being supported by, oh, that's a really good idea uh, we, uh, that you you sh you should develop more, something like that. In in each of these uh, cases, we need uh, communities uh, for um, both the support and the and to hold the imaginative uh, the act of of our spiritual imagination and intellectual imagination of that can um, hold a vision of of a new mode of being, a, a, a life enhancing form of, of human civilization that is in relationship to the rest of the earth community and not in this kind of uh, predatory uh, extractive uh, relationship that is, has, is now proving unprecedentedly self-destructive as well as destructive. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, and I think is, um, things start to open back up and we move past some of this pandemic, I would encourage everybody out there to start looking at ways to start start your own communities um, that are close by. I mean, we can use the technology that is at hand, of course. Um, I think there's something with gathering with people that makes a difference in being able to explore these ideas. And um, it doesn't have to just be Esalen. It doesn't have to just be this one retreat center um, down south or whatever, um, but trying to find a few people to start building this community. Because I think there are a lot more of us out there that are looking for the others, quote unquote, to start having these conversations on a more regular basis. Um, so I think yeah, it's, it's well there's said. A, the, the places are, are, are important, particularly where there's a, a sense of, the, of the, that, that land as being, say, sacred or transformational in itself. But it, it ultimately depends on the people, what people are, are there. And uh, we can, you know, we are now in this kind of uh, privileged position, despite all the downside of technology and the internet and um, the kind of colonizing of our brains that, that high tech has been working uh, on us over the last 30 years in particular. But um, it's allowed us to have communities that are can be non-local that can be very uh, important to uh, to us. Um, but if we can also maintain that the intimacy of actual interpersonal contact on in in the um, physical space, that's that and that can happen anywhere. In some mm -hmm. sense, all places on on this earth are holy land. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I'm just going to ask. I would love sure. to ask one more question. And sure. Yeah. So, Rick, when when we when I interviewed you, it was a while back. It was long before the COVID nineteen pandemic, and at the time, this death rebirth experience, the collective nature that was sort of presenting itself to humanity, was more about the possible collapse of our biosphere and our ecosystem. And and now with COVID nineteen it feels like there's another um, pending <laughs> event. And, and so I'm curious how you would characterize this current situation as, as it you know, relates to a collective near-death experience. Yeah, uh, there's a certain way in which the uh, coronavirus pandemic has uh, concentrated the mind of of the global psyche, you know, of the of, of of the world, in a way that I almost feel as if it's it's almost like an intervention. Um, it's having a very powerful effect because many of us have been aware of the uh, ever magnifying and uh, worsening uh, global climate crisis and the and the mass extinction of, of species it, it just it's it's just on a such a level of magnitude it's the scientists themselves are constantly having to revise their figures in, in amazement as to how rapidly it's happening yet nevertheless human beings being all too human um, there's just been enough capacity to deny to and to remain in a state of denial 
about this global uh, c catastrophe and not acting on it uh, politically, uh, corporately, et cetera, that um, it's the, the COVID-19 crisis has just uh, set in motion on, a, on another level, all many of the um, of the kinds of responses by human by by us and uh, interactions and rethinking of things that we're going to need for the bigger crisis. Uh, and let me just give an example: uh, the the degree to which over the last um, three months that in some sense, uh, uh, the authority and the uh, proactive uh, response by people moved to the local level and to local governance uh, and to the civil society uh, and people, uh, you know, mutual aid uh, uh, groups and uh, governors who were uh, thinking much more um, and, and, and we're getting both better information and acting more <clears throat> responsibly and, and rapidly compared with the, uh, the national level. We, we've seen a kind of, I think, healthy democratization of, of uh, social, political agency. And uh, that's a very valuable thing. But the, ultimately, what we all are kind of recognize, are recognizing is that the very, the very transformation, the very process that, that Stan Groff focused his life work on, which is basically, uh, it's not one he set out to do, it's one that just emerged in the course of, of, of his work with just thousands of people starting in the 60s and including himself. And that is this very powerful kind of death rebirth transformation. And uh, the, there's a way in which he, that kind of transformation, which is really a moral transformation of values, seems to happen. Uh, it's what we need as a as a planet, as a, as a as a nation, as, as as a species, humanity, and that seems to happen most when there is some kind of an encounter with death, some kind of a uh, a, a head-on engagement with our own mortality. There is nothing like a near-death experience to. Uh, to reconfigure our, our moral values. We suddenly go, oh, this thing that I thought was really important seems so unimportant and shallow and superficial to me now. And this seems much more uh, significant. And it, and it happens in a flash. And in some ways, I think many, many people are getting a sense through this experience right now of what's more valuable than they're, re they're rethinking how were they living. There's a certain way in which the sheer momentum of our dynamic civilization was carrying us forward uh, in a kind of unthinking way that that kept creating more and more destruction in its wake. And uh, my colleague Elizabeth Allison at CIS, where I t teach, um, she she. Uh, use the term that we're in this pregnant pause. And I thought that's a, that's a good way of describing the way in which uh, so much of the world just had to stop. And it's giving a, an, a, an opportunity to kind of rethink what's most important. And, uh, and, and perhaps as this pandemic um, begins to wind down, it will eventually, uh, we don't know how, but as it does, how or when, but as it does, I think we can start taking the, uh, the new structures that we set up, the new uh, values that may have emerged in this time and, 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 to, and start to uh, build them into the very uh, future of our, of, our, of our lives together. So I'm looking at this as as a, as a very important, it's a kind of near-death experience for our civilization. 
And I'm looking at this as a not only something that is tragically causing, um, you know, deaths and uh, hardship and suffering to many people, uh, it is also producing a kind of um, moral reassessment of of how how we live, and that we are going to all need that in the most uh, global and profound way in uh, as this decade uh, unfolds. The, and yeah, so I'm I'm looking at this one crisis as a kind of the, the most immediate one as something that maybe if if we rise to the occasion may be the basis upon which we can better uh, rise to the occasion of the much huge more huge um, uh, crisis of our of our time which is it, it affects the entire all the species on the planet right yeah it's um <clears throat> it is causing a lot of hardships but i think there is an opportunity here for humanity to do some shifting and, and reevaluating like you're saying so including this the i mean the the, the social injustice which um mm -hmm. we can see it's just pushing it to the surface so clearly the people that were not um be, were being told they're not welcome in the country uh now they're essential workers uh the people who uh can't shelter in place because the nature of their job is to work in a grocery store or or to be a, uh, a a cleaning person in a hospital or something like that, they're they're not making enough money to even uh, pay the the rent, and yet um, they're suddenly essential. At, uh, the lack of universal health care completely uh, affects everybody in in that society. It's not just uh, a kind of we're not individualized atom atomistic uh, entities, skin encapsulated egos, as as uh, Alan Watts used to say. And that's what I mean. I think we're we're getting our daily news is just bringing to the uh, to our consciousness in a way uh, the need for a, a profound reconfiguration of, uh, of of our major life structures at the social level as well as individual. Yeah, I hope yeah. there's more vegetarians that come out of all the <laughs> images of hogs and cows and, you know, having to be euthanized because there aren't meat packing plants and just this sort of factory farming and the concentration of uh, livestock and agriculture and the waste. And I, and I think we're seeing that with all of our systems. Uh, many of these systems that were developed hundreds and sometimes even thousands of years ago that are no longer adequate to, to deal with the complexities that we have on the planet. Uh, and that's becoming very, very obvious. So, um, well, maybe we should open it up to some questions if you're up for that, Richard, on the, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. on the, to the audience. Matt, do you have some questions for us? We do. It's been amazing. Um, so we've got a question from Mishka, and I think it kind of ties into what you were just talking about, actually. So she says, um, for someone studying psychology who has experience with plant medicine and an interest in helping progress the bio psycho social spiritual model of medicine and healing what suggested areas and topics for research do you think we need do you think need attention um so maybe to to sum that up what areas of research do you think people need to to really be diving into right now to progress yeah, my sense is that it really, it depends on, uh, like, every one of us has a kind of unique um, character, you know, background, our, and we each are flowering from the earth in ways that are unique to, to us. And we each have kind of particular passions and things that are calling us, uh, things that really interest us. In a, in a very compelling way that may not be as interesting to somebody else. We need to pay attention to, to that because that's a calling. That's a, that's, 
that's the the anima mundi, the the soul of the world, calling us to um, to follow a particular path, to cultivate certain skills, to uh, research particular areas. So it's not like well, I mean, obviously, it's not a one size fit all, fits all. But if there's any general advice, it's to um, it's to pay close attention to that inner voice that's telling you. Uh, this is where I feel the joy and excitement of life uh, and to pursue that. Uh, and it sounds like the person who, you who asked the question um, uh, through Matt, uh, it sounds like you've, you've got a calling to, uh, that you've already been following quite uh, uh, in, in important ways. Um, I don't know if you have, if you, you were looking for, you know, more more training. Whether it would involve, uh, you know, here at CIS we have a, a center for psychedelic uh, medicine studies and research that are basically preparing people to be able to do uh, psychotherapy using psychedelics uh, in the future, as this becomes much more of a uh, widespread, legitimate phenomenon. It was always it was always spiritually and psychologically legitimate, but it wasn't societally starting in the mid 60s or so. And uh, thank God we're going through a huge shift right now, P partly as a result of Stan Gross work in the background and then many, many new researchers uh, and people like Michael Pollan, who, who I know is going to be um, part of this uh, project that, that you're doing here who have brought to the attention of the larger public the, the value of, of psychedelic therapy. Um, so I think it really depends on what your, your calling is and what, what gives you the sense of, of the life force working within you and, and then paying attention to the, you know, the synchronicities, the little, the little clues that the universe gives to you that this is, this is the right path to, to, be, to be going on. Uh, we, we have to be attuned to a kind of subtle language that the universe speaks to us uh, in, in order to follow our way to, to that which is going to be the most fulfilling both for ourselves, but also our uh, fulfilling what the world needs from us. Amazing, love that answer, thank you. Um, we have another question from Nikki. Do you sense that there's a positive shift coming for humanity? I think it's already happening for many uh, in, in the human community. Uh, the, there is a, a vast awakening that's been going on for many years. Uh, certainly, I, I came of age in the 1960s and there was very much a sense at that point that millions of people were coming into an awareness of hmm, the the sacredness of the earth or uh, becoming uh, aware of uh, the, the need to rethink our, our societal institutions and so forth to do deep uh, the, the, realizing that many other cultures other than the modern and the Western are carrying a uh, wisdom that we deeply need right now. And I think that awakening just keeps increasing and it's happening uh, with great rapidity uh, in our own time. The question is whether that awakening uh, and the positive change that you're talking about is happening at a wide enough scale that it will pull back the Titanic from uh, hitting the iceberg that our civilization, whose name is the Titanic, uh, has uh, been kind of hell bent on aiming towards for so long. And uh, yeah, that's really, the, the question isn't so much whether uh, human beings are going to go, through a big positive transformation 
so many are, but w will enough go through it to be able to uh, to shift the, the levers of power and uh, to affect our species relationship to all the other species on the planet? I have, uh, even though there's lots of reasons for discouragement, um, I think we have sources of hope that we need, that we can draw on, hope from our own spiritual transformations. That's why it's important for us to do uh, our own inner work as much as possible, because once, it, it, once one connects to a deep grounding center that is, uh, that is nourished by the, the sacred ground of being, um, that provides a, a kind of orientation and a centering and a stability that can help us be um, bring in a certain equilibrium to our environment and to help other people to go through that transformation. And it also can give us access to reasons for hope. If something that profound of, profoundly transformative in a good way can happen to me as an individual, um, there's no reason to think that the divine powers that graced me as that individual just had me in mind. Um, it's carrying the whole and uh, it that, but the individual form of it gives me hope for the whole. It gives me a ground, a base, a, a source of having hope. And the thing about hope is that it's not just a kind of rational assessment about the future, looking at the present data. I mean, doing that is really important uh, uh, and can be very discouraging at times. But hope is a, it's a, it's a kind of spiritual um, virtue and a kind, something we, almost, we, we, we cultivate uh, because it can, it's not just a kind of receptive, well, I'm, I'm hopeful about the future. It's an, it's an act that uh, actually seems to reach into the future and plant a seed in it that can grow and then, and then uh, pull us towards it. There's something mysterious about, about uh, hope and, and faith and love. Uh, when those come through us, they help constellate the reality that um, they carry uh, in, in, in a pregnant form. So that's why I think for, for many reasons, both because of you know so much uh, spiritual, uh, both from my own experiences, but from taking in the, the spiritual awakenings and, and uh, disclosures of many other people, uh, the great wisdom literature of the world, um, but also looking at what everything that I look at, it ultimately gives me the sense that the universe cares in some way for this earth and for each individual on it. And uh, although I don't know what form I will what f form humanity is going to have 50 years from now or 100 years from now. I don't know how we will uh, survive or be transformed by what's going on, but I do have faith that uh, we will make it. Um, there's the divine that, that carries, that's, that's aware of the fall of every sparrow um, is also uh, and, and, and that can uh, save the, the wretch in Amazing Grace. You remember the person who wrote Amazing Grace? He was a slave ship captain. So when he said um, Amazing Grace that could save a wretch like me, he wasn't just sort of saying, well, like I'm a wretch. He knew he, he, he what um, kind of moral blindness he had been living out. And to be lifted out of that he recognized any any divine force that could do that to a wretch like me is is capable of of anything, and so um, 
there's there's much to be said about humanity's shadow side, and we really have to be. Uh, I think we are now facing it as never before. We've never seen um, the shadow of human uh, activity as now in terms of what it's doing to the rest of the planet. We've n n never seen. Uh, national leadership uh, across the world uh, ha carrying, um, certainly not in my lifetime, carrying the shadow forms of, of what it is to be um, wealthy or male or powerful or uh, uh, self-oriented or whatever, narcissistic. And, and so we're really having to face the shadow in a certain way. And that's a very crucial part of a psycho-spiritual moral transformation. Uh, and I, I think that uh, if we're able to um, get the depth and breadth of, uh, of spirit to be able to absorb that level of uh, facing the shadow and holding the tension of opposites between the light that we know is is in us and is around us and the shadow that we see i th i think that's that's when the uh the mystical transformation happens but we have to hold that tension of opposites and not just make it we're all light uh or succumb totally to the to the to uh the the despair um it's it's a it's a tightrope we're walking but um these are times that uh, in some sense, I think we can take special uh, joy in in being asked to live at this time. It's it's kind of a privilege to live at a time that matters so much, and where your actions are have so much potential consequence that the future of the world could be um, shifted, even in the most small ways, but in ways that we. Small things have huge consequences. Even your inner thoughts and your uh, and the and the private interactions you have with your with your family and in, in in the home or in your intimate relationships. Those, even if nobody else ever knows about them, they 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 go out and they affect the whole. And and when you go through a transformation, all of us go through it with you. Uh, and it's a it's like nested morphic fields, you know, that are all in contact with each other. So uh, I think, yeah, I, I guess I've covered a lot of ground there, but um, you can perhaps see the thread that I was uh, leading us uh, along. Absolutely, love it. Yeah, I think we have time for one more. Uh, That's right, yeah, one more question. We have one from Zane and he is curious, uh, what is your opinion or experience with transcendental meditation or any form of meditation? Um, I remember Joseph Campbell was asked that question once when uh, he was visiting Esalen. He said, well, my form of meditation is, uh, is, is reading and studying and, and thinking and then, and then writing. Um, and he was very good at it, you know, and, and, and uh, I think each person, I mean, transcendental me meditation and uh, a, a wide range of uh, meditative practices like Vipassana, for example, uh, are, are very, um, very powerful uh, m modes of bringing um, centering, equilibrium, uh, a, uh, bringing us to the possibility of a, um, of a, of a higher mode of consciousness. And I also want to say that there's ways of meditating that involve uh, how you wash the dishes um, and how you go for your walk. And uh, uh, it may, for some people, it could be um, composing music or writing, uh, you know, writing poetry. Uh, there's lots of ways of, of meditating, but I think if you if you have a good meditative practice, it's very clear that people who meditate, there's all sorts of st statistical studies about it, um, that it has had a great deal of um, 
uh, benefit in their in their personal lives. So if you have a practice like that, um, it, it's great. And of course, there's many ways you can now you can just go on online and find good teachers and um, good instructions to get you started. Uh, but um, I also want to expand the notion of of meditation at, into a way of mind how we can mindfully engage life from the beginning to the end of each day. Beautiful. I like Thank that. Because yeah. I think there are a lot of ways to meditate and uh, to pull in that, uh, that equilibrium, as you said. So um, you touched on a couple of things. I'm hesitant to ask this last question, but I feel like I have to because you, you nailed some points there and I just um, would love to ask. And, sure, and also ahead. bringing it back to Stan, um, during your interview, you talked about Stan's approach and, and the courage that it took for him to come out with some of his ideas and his experiences, um, as well as having this kind of so serene equilibrium himself in the way that he approached sitting down with people, communicating with people. And that's something that resonates every time that I've been around Stan. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's something that is absolutely um, beautiful and, and kind of a rare gift, but I think we can all tap into that, hopefully. And I'm wondering, as we're dealing with these shadow aspects, you know, personally, but also collectively, how can we embody some of that serene equilibrium as we face some of these big challenges? Um, you know, whether that is meditation, whether that's reading, uh, connecting with community, or any number of other modalities. Um, but I feel like that's an important piece because Stan really does, has always held that for as long as I've known him and I think for hearing from people that have known him for much longer um, say that over and over again. Yeah. Hmm. You know, S Stan often uh, talks about how it's, from his point of view in the therapeutic relationship, you want the therapist to kind of not uh, be an imposing presence, but more to be a kind of midwife that uh, like is facil facilitating the, the, um, the organic, uh, psychological spiritual unfolding of that of the person and uh yet i always and so he can sort of make the therapist seem rather and, and and himself as being rather unimportant compared to the inner healer and what is uh organically unfolding from from each person going through the the, the practice the process the the breath work or the psychedelic session. And I know what he means, but he also by the, that, that, that kind of spiritual calm, that equilibrium, that capacity to handle whatever kind of outburst or emotional, uh, 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 even you know, physical kind of um, drastic, uh, eruptions and so forth that might happen, even like possession states uh, and so forth. He communicates that to uh, not only the person that he's working with, but it also uh, affects everybody else that's um, either in the group that's watching it or being part of it. Uh, and in some sense, the, the so-called transference um, that happens in psychoanalytic or therapeutic context He's, he's playing a crucial role in helping people, I think, find that center of equilibrium inside themselves. Uh, and I think even when he is not the therapist, he's also affected thousands and thousands of people around the world to, um, just as he had a kind of faith and equilibrium that no matter what you're going through, this can serve your, uh, this can even though it's really dark right now, even though it's really uh, seems like there's there's no way out, um, that's part of the process. And if you can if you can go with it, if you can surrender to it, if you can in some sense embrace it, uh, it I it's going to unfold in a in a very uh, surprising and healing way. And he's been able to convey that to so many people who then they become practitioners they become the facilitators and therapists and so forth. And so his own has kind of gone out into the rest of the world uh, to affect many people who are not directly doing work with him right at that time. But he's, it's not like he's unique in that way. I mean, he's, he's, 
he is unique, of course, in 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 many ways. But he, we all have that center in us potentially, and to find that, I think, is uh, it's a gift. It's a it it comes as a kind of grace, and it comes after. Uh, surrendering oneself and committing oneself to a process that will take one uh, through a journey that will not uh, will often be uh, challenging us beyond what we think we're capable of. And the gift that comes, and I believe it comes for all, maybe not certainly not on demand um, and perhaps not all in one lifetime, but it's a journey. And I believe we're, 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 we're held by a, a deep a benign uh, power uh, that is mindful of everything we're going through. And if we can kind of cultivate uh, a relationship to that power, and help that can help us go through the journey to be able to access that place of profound calmness and equilibrium that uh, and, and you each may have different practices that get get you to that point. I mean, breath work and LSD therapy and ayahuasca journeys are especially powerful versions of that. But it can also be um, the deep state of love between a mother and a child uh, can, um, and what you, what you as a mother might communicate to your child that goes on for the rest of that person's life, but also what the child is communicating to you can transform you as the mother or the father, uh, uh, and, um, serve as a, as a point of, of, of profound kind of existential and spiritual security with which we can, uh, go out into the world and, and take on the, uh, the, the great challenges that we, that we face. That's a very general answer, but I, I think, um, you know, there's many ways to, to get to that, uh, that, that place of equilibrium. And I think it's a kind of lifelong, uh, lifelong journey and, and practice, but Stan does model it in a, in a very admirable way. And, and he's, he's influenced, uh, countless thousands in, in ways that I think have subtly entered into their mode of being as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So basically cultivate it however you can, everybody out there, find that thing that, that brings that out in you because um, it, it does help. So yeah, it could be a tree in your backyard that you have a special right. relationship to, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or on, on your walk, you know, and then you touch that tree and kind of feel the, um, the center and the equilibrium and the ground as its roots go way down into the earth and the, and the, and the leaves and the branches have reached out to the sun and you kind of tune into that, that spiritual being that is uh, living in and through the tree and it can come into you. I mean, it's, yeah, it must, that can, that can seem far out, but it's true. Pretty grounded, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's it. laughs> I would like to suggest that um, for anyone who would like to learn more about Rick's work, and especially, I highly recommend his two books. I've read them both. They're wonderful. Um, Cosmosandpsyche.com is where people can access your essays, Rick, and more. That's right. There's a lot. There's essays and inter, you know um, diff different. Uh, there's some chapters from the book that are there, but also um, other resources that they can explore uh, for um, my particular interests in terms of uh, both archetypal cosmology and, uh, and deep history. And there's also videos of, of lectures and things like that. And we will be posting to our Facebook page a link to your recent talk, What's Happening in the Stars Right Now, which was very informative. I saw that a while back. And that focuses on archetypal cosmology, which is a really fascinating um, way of understanding what's happening in the world and throughout history, actually. Yeah, that was the work that Stan uh, and I kind of stumbled into together 
45 years ago now and uh and it just to our surprise just blossomed uh it influ influenced both both our work in terms of um understanding psych the, the psychological process psychotherapeutic spiritual uh, uh, uh the timing the archetypal character but also uh in uh, illuminated um history and the great historical epochs such as our own that we're going through right now so that's what that that talk that I gave a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, what's happening in the stars today or right now. That's right. What <laughs> sort of like what in God's name is happening in the stars right now? That was <laughs> the, the question I was asked to address by, uh, it was a public program I did for my university. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us. This has yeah. been really lovely. Every time I have the, you know, good fortune to sit and listen to the wisdom that you have you know, the synthesis that you've been able to put together and pull from your historical, psychological, and spiritual perspective is just um, such a treasure. So thank well, you. Yeah, thanks very, for joining us. Really we appreciate it. It's an honor, very, and um, we hope to see you soon. So thank yeah. you for tuning in. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Mitch, uh, and uh, Matt, and Stephen, all the team thank there. You. Yeah, I appreciate uh, very much the, the work you're doing. and. Um, May the uh, sacred cosmos bless us all as we go oh. forward. Thank you. And Take thanks care. for everybody for tuning in. Have yeah. a great day and nights or wherever you are. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.